thank you to Senator Menendez and to the chairwoman of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, Congresswoman Velasquez, for those extraordinary introductions, but more importantly for the outstanding work that you do each and every day. Please give them a huge round of applause. Thank you to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute for inviting us this evening. Michelle and I are thrilled to be here with so many friends to kick off Hispanic Heritage Month. I want to acknowledge a few people before I begin my remarks. First, somebody who I believe is going to go down in history as one of the greatest speakers of the House of all time, Nancy Pelosi, is here. Two of our outstanding cabinet secretaries are in the House, Secretary of the Interior Ken Salazar and our wonderful Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis. I want to thank our mistress of ceremonies, Soledad O'Brien. I want to con congratulate uh, Eva Longoria Parker and Arturo Sandoval and Lynn Manuel Miranda on your well-deserved awards this evening. I love you back. And I want to thank all the members of Congress, the local elected officials, the CHCI alumni, and all who work day in and day out to advance the Hispanic community and America as a whole. I also want to acknowledge and thank all of the outstanding Latino leaders serving across my administration, because I am proud that the number of Latinos I've nominated to Senate-confirmed positions at this point far exceeds any administration in history. And I'm especially proud that a whole bunch of them are Latinas. <laughs> and as I've said before, one of my proudest moments of my presidency was the day Justice Sonia Sotomayor swore an oath and ascended to our nation's highest court and spark new dreams for countless young girls all across America. Now, some of you may remember, I first joined you here two years ago as a candidate for this office. And we spoke then about how, after years of failed policies here in Washington, after decades of putting off the toughest challenges, we had finally reached a tipping point, a point where the fundamental promise of America was at risk. We talked about how these challenges impacted the Latino community, but also about how they're bigger than any one community. I said then that if, if a young child is stuck in an overcrowded and underperforming school, it doesn't matter if she's black or white or Latino. She is our child, and we have a responsibility to her. That if millions of Latinos end up in the emergency room because they don't have health care, it's not just a problem for one community. It's a problem for all of America. When millions of immigrants toil in the shadows of our society, that's not just a Latino problem. That is an American problem. We've got to solve it. As Dr. King told Cesar Chavez all those years ago, our separate struggles are really one. And that truth became painfully clear when, less than a week after I had appeared before the CHC, some of the biggest Wall Street firms collapsed and the bottom fell out of our economy. Millions 
of families across America were plunged into the deepest recession of our lifetimes. In a Latino community that had been hard hit before the recession was hit even harder. So when I took office, I insisted that we could only rebuild our economy if we start growing the economy for all of our people, not just some of our people. If we provided economic security for all of our working families all across America. We had to renew the fundamental idea that everybody in America, everybody in America, has a chance to make it if they try. No matter who they are, no matter what they look like, no matter where they come from or where they were born. That's the idea that drives us. The chance to make of our lives what we will. And I know that many of you are thinking tonight about a task that is central to that idea. And that's our fight to pass comprehensive immigration reform. Now, I know that many of you campaign hard for me. And understandably, you're frustrated that we have not been able to move this over the finish line yet. I am too. But let me be clear. I will not walk away from this fight. My commitment is getting this done as soon as we can. We can't keep kicking this challenge down the road. Now, there's no doubt the debate over how to fix all this has been a fractured and sometimes painful one in this country. And let's face it, there are some who seek uh, political advantage in distorting the facts and in dividing our people. We've seen it before. Some take advantage of the economic anxiety that people are feeling to stoke fear of those who look or think or worship differently, to inflame passions between us and them. I have news for those people. It won't work. There is no us and them. In this country, there's only us. There's no Latino America or Black America or White America or Asian America. There's only the United States of America. All of us, all of us join together. Indivisible. If we appeal to the American people's hopes over their fears, we'll get this done. We already know what this reform looks like. Just a few years ago, when I was a senator, we built a bipartisan coalition around a basic framework under the leadership of Senator Kennedy and Senator McCain and President Bush. We rallied with leaders from the business community and the labor communities and the religious communities. Many of you were there. And the bill we forged wasn't perfect. It wasn't what any one person might think was optimal, but because folks were willing to compromise, we came up with a common sense, comprehensive reform that was so far from the false debates, the, 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 the notion that somehow, on the one hand, there's mass amnesty, or on the other hand, there's some unworkable mass deportation. That wasn't what we were talking about, and the American people, I think, were ready to embrace a common sense solution. And we passed that bill through the United States Senate. But since that effort fall apart, fell apart, we have seen how broken and bitter and divisive our politics has become. Today, the folks who yell the loudest about the federal government's long failure to fix this problem are some of the same folks standing in the way of good faith efforts to fix it. And under the pressures of partisanship and election year politics, most of the 11 Republican senators who voted for that reform just four years ago have backed far away from that vote today. 
And that's why states like Arizona have taken matters into their own hands. And my administration has challenged that state's law, not just because it risks the harassments of citizens and legal immigrants, but it is the wrong way to deal with this issue. It interferes with federal immigration enforcement. It makes it more difficult for law, local law enforcement to do its job. It strains state and local budgets. And if other states follow suit, we'll have an unproductive and unworkable patchwork of laws across the country. We need an immigration policy that works, a policy that meets the needs of families and businesses while honoring our tradition as a nation of immigrants and a nation of laws. We need it for the sake of our economy, we need it for our security, and we need it for our future. And I understand it may not be the easy thing to do politically. It's easier to grandstand. But I didn't run for president to do what's easy. I ran to do what's hard. I ran to do what's right. And when I think something's the right thing to do, even my critics have to admit I'm pretty persistent. I won't let it go. They can call me a lot of things, but they know I don't give up. Now, the Senate's going to have a chance to do the right thing over the next few weeks when Senator Reid brings the DREAM Act to the floor. Keep in mind, in the past, this was a bill that was supported by a majority of Democrats and Republicans. There's no reason why it shouldn't receive 